I mean, if I told the story, and I said I was a widow at 48 years old, I had six children, I had to work full time, that might sound hard, but I can't remember it being that hard. I, I've lived half my year in Utah, and half my, I mean, half my life in Utah, and half my life in Arizona. And uh, I moved down to a little tiny little no-count town in Arizona when I was 10, which was called Scottsdale, Arizona, which now is the biggest metropolis, snooty place in the world, but my house doesn't exist anymore and all. But I, uh, I had a good growing up. I had wonderful parents, and we had good times together, and we laughed a lot. And I've always had a situation where we have laughed a lot. And uh, I taught school. I've taught school for 23 years. I taught down at Orem my first year, and then I taught in Arizona for at uh, Coronado High School and and Thunderbird High School. And then I moved up here, and I taught at Fremont and at the junior highs for a little bit. I love teaching. I can't imagine anybody teaching with the pandemic now because I needed the one-on-one -on -one with the kids to be able to enjoy their company and seeing the light go on when they realized what I was talking about or coming to a short story or something. And my hobbies are the fact that I am probably the most trivia person in the world. I can answer just about any question, at least I used to before I got old. And I I love cats. I love my kids. I have six children and 22 grandchildren. And uh, they are the love of my life. I enjoy them so much. And it just dawned on me as I was talking to my daughter this morning that she is now, she will turn uh, 49 this birthday. And her dadhood would have already been gone for a year when he, was, he died at 48. Mm -hmm. And I think of how much of his life he's missed, he missed out on when I think of all that's happened since, since he passed away because he's been gone for 25 years, 26 years. And... Uh, we had a lot of fun as a family. We always laughed a lot. And as far as my finding out, he'd gone on a mission to Austria. And when he was in his mission, he had colitis. And when he got colitis, that turned into his uh, colon cancer. And then he found out that he did have colon cancer and he had a good surgery. And then five years later, they found out that it had come back and that was, he died shortly thereafter. How old were you and your kids when this began? Uh, when he died, my kids were, I had a nine-year-old son, Jamie, and a 11-year-old son, Carson, and a 12-year-old daughter, Lexi, and a 16-year-old son, Travis, and an 18-year-old daughter, Shelby, and a 21-year-old daughter, Melanie. That's close, anyway. And I was subtract, <laughs> hadn't subtract, I was probably 40, 49 about then, mm -hmm. and uh, we were, so you subtract five years from that, that's when he found out his cancer had come back, and that's when he had his surgery, and that's, and the, the person who operated on him said he felt like someone else's hands were helping him, and he investigated the church just from the spiritual experience he had had with this whole situation, and Ron felt okay for a while, and then five years later, that's when it then took its, his toll on him at that point in time. But uh, he was a jeweler, and he worked hard, and we never were rich, but he did beautiful things, and he was a very kind, kind man, and he would do so many things for other people, and he was a delight to be around. And uh, I asked my kids after he died how they were doing. When he died, I was sitting with my two sons, who were then 11 and 12, and uh, or 10, 11, and I said, how, how are you guys doing now without having your dad around? And, and they said, you know, he worked so much and he did so much church work. We didn't see him all that much anyway, so it isn't really that different. And I thought maybe that's something that all of us women need to know, that if our families are so involved in other things, that maybe we're not taking the time to, to really concentrate on what it's going to be like if somebody were to be gone. And uh, they did fine. My daughter's Lexi. She had a really hard time, and my daughter Melanie had a really hard time. But to show you the how insensitive we are as a family, my daughter uh, Shelby, Melanie had a hard time. Shelby said one time to Melanie when Melanie was having a hard time, Shelby said, well, we should have picked the healthy one because Melanie just absolutely adored her dad. He was everything to her, and Shelby and I had a great relationship. I thought it was kind of crude to say, it's too bad you didn't get the one that lived. But... Uh, <laughs> They were, they, Melanie was on a mission when we found out that he wasn't going to make it. Mm -hmm. And she had like two months left of her mission, but she came home 
and uh, we had, it was a very dear time. He was told he only had seven days, a week to seven, week to ten days to live when he was in the hospital at that point, and he lived for seven and a half weeks. And those were glorious times because he had such an incredible attitude about it. And he was talking about how excited he was to meet the Savior and how he just felt like um, it was going to be okay. And so because he felt like it was going to be okay, we felt like it was going to be okay. And that made a ton of difference. He was never squeamish about it or afraid or anything. He was very much handled it very well. What were your initial feelings like? How did you move through each day? I taught school full time and I had six kids and I think I had to keep my focus to get by and uh, he had been sick for quite a long time and I'm not a real sensitive person, I'm not a real crier or anything like that and I know some people who have such a hard time with things like this and I didn't because I had such a strong testimony that that it was going to be okay and I think that was the thing that got me through more than anything was my testimony and I want to stress again at this point in time how incredibly important it is that we read the Book of Mormon all the time. And I was uh, thinking about the Sunday lesson and the song came to me, uh, that hold to the rod, the iron rod, and I thought, hold to the rod, the iron rod, tis and true, the iron rod is the word of God will help safely get us through. And I thought that's what I just cannot stress enough how important I think the Book of Mormon is to keep us focused on, on the things that really, really matter. And like I said, Ron's attitude was great. And I had a friend whose husband had passed away, and my husband Ron had served in the bishopric with him. And I saw her and I said, Laura Lee, I'm really going to have a hard time with this. Like, this is because you went through this, and your husband lived for quite a while after he was destined to be dying. And I said, This is so hard. And she says, Oh, you'll be fine. She says, don't worry a bit, you'll be fine. And it was so funny how that really truly went to my very soul. And I thought, if she can do it, I can do it. And it made a difference to me. Okay. Will you share how his death unfolded? Yeah, he went to... Uh, he was in the hospital off and on for a while then. And then I was teaching school and then I got a call. And they said I needed to come down to the hospital. So I went down to the hospital. And that's when they told him he didn't have very long to live. And it was amazing. You know, you hear people talk about these experiences that are supposed to be so devastating to them, but the Spirit comes there. I love my daughter Melanie's comments on our podcast about how close the Spirit is and how He wants to get us through things. And He is there. And I really felt the presence. I remember even the night we came home from the hospital, my sister-in-law came over and stayed with us for a while, and we talked about different things. And I couldn't believe how calm I felt. And that was the biggest thing to me, was just the fact that I was calm, Ron was calm. We were really quite on top of it. And then as things unfurled, then we went around our business. He stayed, he was in at home, and uh, I had to give him the medications and stuff. And he, he was so good. And we'd go in there in, his, in our room, and we'd watch movies, and we'd... All the family would be together, and we had really, really positive experiences during that time that could have been so awful. Mm -hmm. Were you with him when he died? Yes. My daughter and I went into... Uh... One thing somebody told me once, and I thought it was really interesting, and I didn't hear it until afterwards, but... Um, I, in fact, this this tells you, this is my noble moment, was the fact that I was teaching, but I couldn't teach for that last period of time, and we had to do tests. And we had to do essay tests for the state, for the state. And my kids, I had five classes of English, and all those kids, 150 kids, had to write these essays. But as soon as they got done, they had to be graded, so they had to get... Uh, I had to get them all graded, so I would set my alarm for 2 o'clock in the morning and I go downstairs and grade essays until everybody started moving around again. And uh, so I had to get all those tests graded, but I can remember that it was, a, it was a special time because I had the strength and I had everything to, all the energy to do that, but that one morning when I had gone and test, graded some of the tests and gone back to my bed, bed, the bedroom and I lay there and Ron started kind of jerking around and kind of Ooh, it was awful. He was just kind of having a hard time. And I ran down and got Melanie. I said, Melanie, I don't, I think your dad is dying. And so we went up and we knelt by the foot of the bed and we watched him. And he did. He 
dressed around a little bit and then he passed away and we watched it happen. And uh, I went to get a temple recommend sometime later and I was talking to somebody and just out of the blue she says, you know, sometimes when people, they have a hard time getting out of their body. Mm. And I thought, what an interesting concept that that wasn't him stressing to live, it was stressing to go on and move on. And so it was a kind of a tender moment to think that we had been there and we had seen it happen and we went and told the kids, and this was kind of an interesting point to me, was my kids had these two very dear friends. Jamie and Carson had these really good friends. And they went down to, they were at home, and Eric and Kyle came over and knocked on the door. And everybody knew that he was going to pass away sometime soon, but they knocked on the door and they said, Hi, can you come out and play? And Jamie and Carson says, uh, Our dad passed away this morning. And they said, Oh but can you come out and play? Oh. And I thought that was kind of neat to see that life will go on and that with the people that, you know, that will go on. So it was very, very interesting to me because after he died, the next, that day was very much like, you know, it was just kind of a, a normal day. And uh, I remember that night, Shelby's boyfriend at the time was Joe Strand. He's the bishop of the second ward now. And he was just, he just has been a wonderful family member. And that night we went downstairs and we played bingo. He handed out bingo cards and we all played bingo and everybody seemed to be doing quite well. And uh, we, he died on a Saturday and a Sunday we went to church and everybody was saying, what are you doing here? Why in the world are you at church today? And I remember thinking, where else would we be? Why wouldn't we be at church today? And I think they were expecting a lot more mourning, you know, and that kind of thing out of us. But we went to church and, uh, and it was fine, but we... His funeral was beautiful. It was great. And a good friend of ours had interviewed Ron before he died, knowing he was going to die, and asking about all how we were going to do and all that. And he used that in his talk. But the most, this was the funny. This is awful because it's so funny. But uh, we were on the way to the mortuary that the day of his funeral. We just had the funeral, this very special, dear funeral. We we're on the way to the mortuary. Very tender moment. And Melanie turns to me and she says, Mom, can we have a man like unto Moroni on his headstone? And I, being the snarky mother that I am, I said, no, because they charge by the letter and it would be too expensive. And so Melanie hesitated for a minute and she says, well, can we have Moron-like? <laughs> I thought that was so funny. So that kind of summed up our, our ability to carry on through a time that should have been really tough. And uh, so he died on June 10th and so school was out and we started traveling after that. We went, we put 3,000 miles on the car during that summer going to Utah and to California and different places and we traveled a lot and I, I think maybe because we had such a long time to prepare for it, it wasn't as hard as it would have been if it had been something that had been an accident or something like that, but we had readied ourselves for it and so uh, my daughter went up to to BYU after she came home from her mission. My other daughter went to SUU and Travis was 16 and he was at Thunderbird High School and he was fine and the other kids were fine except like I say Lexi had a harder time than I realized and I wasn't good enough to really reach out for what her pain was and I tried to explain her pain away and, and that was wrong. I tried to say well, maybe you're just overly tired or maybe this or maybe that and I didn't let her mourn as much as I should have done. What were the biggest challenges after his death? I don't know. I look back on it and I think, was it hard having... I mean, if I told the story and I said I was a widow at 48 years old, I had six children, I had to work full time, that might sound hard, but I can't remember it being that hard. I really can't because he worked so much and he had been so sick and it was such a relief to have him be out of his pain and I continued working. I went through the summer and then I went back to teaching that next year and then the year after that I moved up to Utah from Phoenix and uh, I cannot, uh, maybe it's the way it's, maybe it's been glossed over in my head or something but I don't remember it ever being that hard. Had good friends, had good associates, loved the gospel. I never really went through a horrendous downstage with it. Did you feel an increased capacity as you mothered alone? How did you do that? To mother alone? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah. But you kind of realize, again, he had been very busy with bishop jobs. He'd been very busy with work. He'd work like in, at Christmas time. He was a jeweler, so he was working from 1st of November through December without ever getting. He'd work till midnight. He'd go to work in the morning and get work till midnight. And, and I didn't see him much. So those things that needed to be done, I pretty much did then. So it wasn't any real difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a wonderful sense of humor. So I missed him. I mm -hmm. missed him being there. And all, but as far as life being harder or something, I don't remember it being that big a deal. You seem like a very positive person. Does that come easily for you? What brings yeah. you joy? Yeah, I think that I have, I think I'm kind of insensitive because <laughs> I can, I can make it through things. And I remember when I was in like fifth or sixth grade and all the girls were talking these sad, sad stories and they'd sit around telling their sad stories and cry and cry. And I remember sitting there and I'd go, <laughs> trying to trying get to tears up because I couldn't get tears up. And uh, I think that I, I have a very positive attitude and I think it's a blessing to me. It isn't anything I've created. It's, it, I was born with that ability to, to enjoy and I, I enjoy my kids. I enjoy my grandkids. I got these, these four new grandkids that are just a riot and they're down in uh, Kaysville. And it's so fun for me to be around those kids. But I was never good about, I, don't, I look back on it, I feel bad about the mother I was and the grandmother I was in that I always worked. Mm -hmm. and so I didn't have the time to, to give a lot more to the kids than, than I would like to have done or to the grandkids. And people, I read the old obituaries, you know, and they say, oh, never missed a game, never did this. And I think that wasn't me. I wasn't always there. How do you feel about that? bad. But I couldn't have done anything different. It's you do what you have to do. So I can't say, oh, I wish so badly I hadn't had to work, blah, blah, blah. I did what I did, and I can't look back and change it. And so I'm a little bit sorry. Travis, my uh, son now, who's, how old is he now? 40s. He said that he always felt that bad because his dad didn't go out and throw a ball with him in the backyard or, or do things with him that were more type things you'd expect a father and son to do. And I said, but Travis, you got to realize that he was sick. He died when you were 16. He was ill from nine on. He had had this thing from before that. And you've got to take into consideration that he was trying hard to put food on our plates, and he was working hard, and he was doing the things he thought was right, and he didn't have time to do those kind of things. And I think it helped Travis a little bit, because I think he needed to know that that was something that... Mm -hmm. that it was as it was. Yeah. And my daughter, Melanie, still struggles, and she uses in her broad her podcast a lot how much, how much she loved her dad. And the girls did; they just adored him. Shelby, who said that, was just being a little bit sarcastic because they all had a wonderful, wonderful relationship with their dad, and he loved them, and he loved all his kids, and we were a happy family. What have you gained through this? What perspective do you have today that you wish you had at the beginning of this journey? I don't. I don't. I live it a day at a time. I didn't look at it ahead of time as what's going to happen, what's going to be like when. I didn't, I feel like we did it as the best we could. All of us did. Just that if anybody ever wants to talk about something like this, I, I like talking about it because I want to show people that it doesn't have to be so hard. It doesn't have to be so hard. And then sometimes it's going to be that hard. I really almost feel guilty that I didn't feel more like that. I loved my husband, I really did. It wasn't like he was no big deal, but I loved him. But I think that for some reason, I think we're all created differently and some people are gonna have more hard times with things than others. And I just was able to do okay. I think you're amazing. Do you really, or did that come across harsh? No, I think you're amazing, you are. Stoic. But it, it, yeah, I am, but is that good or bad? It's good. It got you through this, and you carried on. But that was my personality. It wasn't mm -hmm. something I tried to do. It was just how I am. Mm -hmm. I think it's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you.